I wanted to do video too on a, on a problem that I posted that there was some interest, but nobody actually commented with a solution. It deals with the floor functions. In fact, it deals with the floor function that is actually part of an infinite series. Now, it sounds kind of scary, but really, it's not that big a deal. Um, it, the, the floor function is very discrete. And so the, it's not like you have to know the ratio test or comparison test or anything normally associated with the uh, infinite series. So it's a little bit of overkill to actually use infinite series in conjunction with this. But just a little review on what we mean by floor function. Um, the floor, and this is square brackets or like half square brackets, the floor of any expression is always going to map to a, to an integer, an expression that would evaluate to any number. You know, for example, if this expression mapped to uh, ended up being 3.8, the floor of 3.8 is just three. And also, uh, simpler case, the floor of any integer is just the integer because it doesn't have a fractional part. So again, this membership of the natural numbers, Z for Zollin, right? Uh, the, this expression is always going to map to a, a, a integer. Now, for the problem we're doing today, it's, it's just going to be mapping to natural numbers. But what I did, I, I posed, I wrote this problem down and then gave a little bit of, spoke about it just a little bit and asked, this actually defines a function, okay? It defines a function of K. If you notice here, N is the index of the summation. K is just an input, all right? So N will be ranging from one to infinity and K is just an arbitrary uh, natural number or integer, I guess, uh, that, that serves as input to this infinite series. Now, it turns out it's very important. Uh, you could do this by hand, but it'd be very tedious. The best thing to do is try to establish a lemma regarding this uh, sum end, I guess you'd call it. Okay, so let's get busy doing that because doing this manually is not a good idea. So uh, let's move along. Now, this is really like a lot of number theory stuff. It breaks down into two cases. All right, so uh, case one, we'll go ahead and assume that K is a multiple of N. Another way of saying it is N is a divisor of K. All right, so now, so if we, uh, we have the floor of K over N right here, well, K is a multiple of N, so uh, the N's cancel. The floor of M is M easy, easy pickings, right? Not much going on right there. Now, what about uh, K minus one over N? Well, that's equal to M minus one because if you rewrite this, uh, if you rewrite this input argument is M N minus one over N, you get M minus one over N. But uh, one over N is gonna be less than one, right? It could be one, but it, it really doesn't make any difference. It's gonna typically be a fraction uh, less than one. And so that's gonna pull it down to the next multiple which would be M minus one. All right, and so uh, when you subtract these two, when you subtract M uh, minus M minus one, again, M minus M minus one, you get this statement right here. So this is the result anytime that uh, uh, K is a multiple of N or N is a divisor of K. All right, this is the result. You're always gonna get one if K is a multiple of N. Now the other case um, is if it's not, all right, if it's not. Now here, this one's marginally more difficult, but if N is not a divisor of K, then we can use the division algorithm to write it like this. Uh, K is equal to some quotient times N plus R. Now you'll notice here's, this is kind of an important part right here. Notice how the division algorithm would normally return less than or equal to right here. I don't know if I can get this highlighted or not, folks. Yes, all right. Okay, right there, that would normally be a less than or equal to, wouldn't it? But since N is not a divisor of K or it's not, uh, it's not a multiple, this has to be a strict inequality right here, right? It has to be strict. It's not, it can't be less than or equal to because we're saying that N is not a divisor, all right? And so if it, if it were, then you would have a, re a possibility of a remainder by a remainder of zero, of course. So anyway, now you so you, in a sim um, fashion very similar to what we did yesterday, or not yesterday in the previous part here, uh, k is equal to q n plus r by the division algorithm, but uh, that simplifies to q plus r over n, and again that's just going to map to q because r over n is a number uh, less than one, right? That's just a property of floor functions. Uh, 
If the, say, for example, think of R over N as being three over five. Well, Q plus three over five is just gonna map back down to the greatest integer less than that value, right? And so uh, something quite similar happens right here. If you subtract one from Q N plus R, you get, uh, you get this statement right here. So again, it's the same kind of situation. Uh, you're gonna have a fraction here less than one, and so you see in both cases, they're just going to map to the quotient given by the division algorithm. You see this quotient Q, this quotient Q is going to be the floor in both cases. So Q minus Q is zero. So you see, we actually have, uh, if, if it's, uh, it's not a divisor, this expression returns a zero. If it is a divisor, uh, if it is a divisor, it returns one. So those are the only two circumstances. Is a divisor, returns one, uh, not a divisor, uh, return zero. Now let's work a concrete example. All right. Now the one I thought up here was uh, I just want to keep my numbers small here. And so eight has divisors one, two, four, and eight, of course, right? So I actually did this so called infinite summation, but you can really see that all the stuff that matters is early on. Now I won't go through each one of these with you, but so this is for n equals one, right? And so the floor of this is eight. The floor of this is certainly seven, right? Now, right over here, uh, this is for n equals two, floor four, uh, floor three. So that, that gives a one. So this evaluates to one, this evaluates to a one. But let's check out the case for three. Now, notice that three, 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 three right here. I hope you guys, uh, the, uh, the three is not a divisor. I listed the divisors right here, right? Three is not a divisor, but look what happens here. Eight thirds. Is two and two thirds that has a floor of two. Uh, seven thirds um, is two and one third that also has a floor of two. So this evaluates to zero. Now let's just go on. I said I wasn't going to do it all. Here I am, you know. Now for four, which is a divisor, you have two, okay, minus the floor of seven fourths, which is one. So that evaluates to one. All right. So you see, but what we've done here, we went all the way out to eight, our very last divisor. And this, this puny little infinite series is just gonna be looking at zeros the rest of the way, right? Because we've exhausted all our divisors. And so this summation, this infinite summation actually evaluates to four, which is uh, incidentally is the number of divisors of the composite number eight. Now that should give you some more wide ranging thoughts on this, what it really is set theoretically. It's pretty obvious right now. But, but anyway, and I don't, I'm not saying it's useful, but I just thought it was interesting to link the infinite series uh, to, the, to this kind of discrete mathematics of the floor functions. So again, this was the original problem that I posed that again, nobody took the time to comment. And I understand we, we're all busy, you know, but I posed this problem. There were some interest, there was some interest, you know, but nobody actually, uh, there was a few hits and, and you could tell there was some activity, but nobody went to the trouble to answer it. I don't know if they weren't interested or they just, didn't know or what. But anyway, now you can try f of 26, and it, it, it's very much similar kind of reasoning. All righty, folks. Um, hope you enjoyed that.